Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the South Texas Regional Family Medicine Grand Rounds. Our department's mission statement is inventing a healthier future for families and communities in San Antonio, South Texas, and beyond through excellence in patient-centered care, research, and education. Next slide, please. Thank you for in advance for muting your microphone once the presentation begins, being attentive to the presenters and engaged in the session, keeping your cameras on when appropriate, registering for CME credit for each session and completing and submitting a session evaluation form. Next slide, please. Uh, today is uh, September 13th, 2023, and our activity code is the following. It is 10093214. And in order to get CME credit, you need to text uh, the toll-free number of 844-502-1338. Uh, make sure you text ATTEND 10093214. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the CME credit via text, like I just went over. Again, the activity code for today, which is September 13th, 2023, is 10093214. Next slide, please. Here's information on CME transcripts. I'll leave this up for just a moment. Next slide, please. And the Academy, uh, American Academy of Family Physicians AAFP members, you can use this login information as well. Next slide, please. Uh, here are the nationally established uh, physician core competencies for our grand rounds. I'm going to leave this up for a moment so you can all read it. All right, thank you, next slide. In the conflict of interest statement, uh, Dr. Davila has no financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. Next slide, please. I'm gonna now hand this off to Dr. Nado to introduce our speaker today, thank you. Well, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Davila, um, Annalika Davila back to the residency. She's one of our uh, former graduates. It always makes me proud to have one of our former graduates come to give us a grand rounds. Dr. Davila is an associate professor here in uh, this department. She is uh, jointly appointed with uh, Family and Community Medicine and the Biggs Institute for Alzheimer's and Neurodegenerative Diseases. She completed her medical training, her medical school here at the university and did her residency here with us at, the, uh, at this family medicine residency and then pursued her fellowship in geriatrics and hospice and palliative uh, medicine at the Utusca VA site. She is the medical director of the UT Geriatrics and Supportive Care Clinic and um, is the associate medical director of a community hospice. So Dr. Davila is gonna talk to us about comprehensive care for, for older adults. Thank you, Dr. Nato. And yes, very excited to be here to talk about, obviously my passion, which is caring for older adults. Um, I do recognize that there's probably, um, this is all for South Texas, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our clinic and what we do as well. So we are the UT Health Geriatrics and Supportive Care Clinic. Um, we are a comprehensive care clinic for geriatrics, which means we do have a clinic here. Um, we are actually located in the Christus Towers, but obviously UT. Um, and we are located in the Christus Towers because we paired up with Christus Santa Rosa Medical Center. And so we do geriatric and palliative care uh, consults at the uh, hospital. If our patients um, discharge from the hospital and need rehab, we go to Warm Springs Rehab and Medical Center. And if they need skilled care, we go to a few different um, skilled nursing facilities to follow them there. We also, um, as of 2020 and a little bit before 2020, actually, we started home visits for our patients. So we do do home visits. We go to assisted livings, independent livings. We pretty much go anywhere um, the patient needs us. And then we are also a hospice medical director. So we work with four different hospices um, that, that we continue to take care of our patients and our families. So we really do a wide, broad um, spectrum of geriatrics, which I love, and so I'm, again, I'm happy to talk to y'all 
today about um, caring for older adults. So my hope is um, by the end of the presentation, we'll get some um, information on how to assess the functional ability of an older adult, um, define different components of a comprehensive geriatric assessment, describe the age-friendly health systems, the four M's, which is a, a form of a rapid screen so that you can kind of get through taking care of older adults maybe a little quicker, and then other rapid screens, because I, I do understand in family medicine, you've got 15 minutes and you're trying to do a lot in that time. And so how can we help you help your older adults? So why do we treat older adults differently, right? And, and you know, coming into family medicine, you're taught from the beginning, babies and children are not small adults. And I really do feel pediatrics and geriatrics are pretty common, right? So um, or, or the same. So geriatrics is kind of the same. Older adults are not the same as regular adults. Um, so we do have to look at them a little differently. Um, as we treat, you know, ch children and babies, we're basing things on age and weight. In geriatrics, we try not to be ageist, right? We're not looking at age as, as the sole factor. We are looking at function. A person's function will dictate how we are providing care to them. Um, so, you know, again, I may have a 50 year old who is in a nursing home and really not functional, right? How I treat that person versus a 75 year old who's running marathons. Very different treatment based on their function. And of course, we are getting our oldest old now, right? Patients 85 and older. So at some point, age may be a factor, but, but function really is the key. And similar to pediatrics, right? We want parents involved when that's appropriate. And in geriatrics, we've got to get the families involved as well. Um, so children may be the ones coming, siblings. I have a lot of siblings that help um, our patients. Like I said, I do have some really young um, patients with dementia that have parents that are their caregivers. Um, and then you know, bless the souls of neighbors and people who just kind of come to help um, patients. So we're, we're really a, have to get everybody involved in care. And the goal of our comprehensive geriatric assessment is in addition to determining medical status, really looking at these other components that are affecting their care. Um, so looking at their functional capabilities, looking at psychosocial status, and really trying to develop an overall plan for treatment and follow-up. As I was reviewing um, my presentation, it, it does get a little overwhelming by the end. <laughs> you know, I, I have to remind myself, right? 15 minutes, how are you doing all this? And, and I want to take a moment here to say this really is a team approach, right? One of the core components on um, what uh, this Grand Rounds is supposed to be about is really interdisciplinary teams, working with our team members, you know, really utilizing other people, um, you know, pharmacists, the nurses, um, our, our psychologists, our social workers, our community health workers, promotoras, right? How do we come together as a team for some of these patients to just provide the best care that we can? So the comprehensive geriatric assessment, when performed on an appropriate outpatient population, which we'll talk about that in a bit, um, and when they have adhered to the interventions, we have shown to, most importantly, prevent functional decline, prevent health-related decline, um, again, very important, right, to improve mental health, um, improve, you know, kind of improve or prevent, right, long-term care placement, at least postpone long-term care placement, um, improving diagnostic accuracy and cost-effectiveness, right? As UT, we, we are an ACO. We, we are responsible for the care that we provide our patients. So we really do need to be cost-effective and caring for our older adults well is, is a, an important part of that. So who benefits from um, a comprehensive geriatric assessment? So an older adult, right, again, it's not a catch-all phrase. You know, there, there are different levels of older adults. 
Um, they do categorize by age. That's when you're hearing young, old, middle, old, oldest, old. But here again, we're focusing on function. So we do have the people who are too well to benefit, right? These are healthy individuals that maybe do not have a lot of medical conditions. Um, if they do have some medical conditions or well controlled, you know, we can really treat those patients at, at any clinic. It really does not have to be someone who's focusing on a comprehensive geriatric assessment. And then we have the patients that, you know, can benefit. And these are patients that, you know, they have treatable conditions, but they're, you know, extensive conditions or they're severe conditions. Um, these conditions or medical um, diseases can affect their quality of life. Um, they have conditions that are very expensive to care for. They are having other socioeconomic and physiological changes. Um, they may be needing rehab, they may need home health, right? We're really needing that team approach to take care of this patient. So this is a person that really would be appropriate. And then there are the people who are too sick to benefit, right? These are people who have really end-stage diseases, maybe very frail or cognitively unable to really kind of understand a plan and, and follow through with a plan. And this is actually a really nice slide because here at our clinic at the UT Health Geriatrics and Supportive Care, we're kind of undergoing our own revision of how we take care of patients here. Um, and we are actually using this, right? We are looking at our patients and saying, okay, before we used to take everybody 65 and older, we really don't have the bandwidth to do that. Um, so now how do we look at patients and say, you know, these people are doing so well, they really don't need the team approach. And these are people that should go just to the family medicine or internal medicine um, physicians. And how do we maintain the patients that really need that team approach so that we can continue to provide them that care? Um, so again, we are using it in real world and we're really using it right now to help us figure out which patients we continue to provide um, primary care services for. And this is also always a great slide um, to throw in, to talk about, to again, reinforce what we learned in medical school, right? Older adults do not have the physiologic reserve to bounce back the way um, they used to when they were younger. So here on the uh, y-axis, right, is physiologic reserve. And on the x-axis, we have aging, and this blue line is the physiologic limit beyond where homeostasis cannot be restored. So a younger patient, you know, whatever healthy age, younger um, and healthy person, they can experience a stress. They have that physiologic reserve so that their body can be restored and they can get better. And as they age or just are more frail, right, the stress they experience, um, can pass their physiologic limit. And now they don't have the ability to recover the way they used to. Um, so their new baseline is, is gonna be a different baseline than what they were at um, prior to getting sick. And sorry, I didn't mention, I'm always happy to take questions in between. Um, so if there are any questions, please feel free to um, reach out. I was just checking the chat, but it looks like uh, no questions quite yet in terms of the chat. So now if we look at the different components of a geriatric assessment. So again, I, I, um, I promise you by the end, we will, we will summarize it a little bit better. But yes, there are multiple components to a geriatric assessment. Um, medical, functional, psychological, and then the social environmental. So we'll first focus on the medical assessment looking at their comorbid conditions, medication review, and nutrition is one that they consider in this um, component. I didn't focus on um, the typical medical conditions, right? Diabetes, hypertension. We know an older adult is going to have all those medical problems just like every other uh, patient may have. What I really wanted to focus on are the geriatric syndromes. 
the specific things that a geriatrician may kind of focus on a little bit more. Um, and so just kind of bringing your attention to those. Um, dementia, so cognitive, right, dementia, delirium. So dementia, and we have to understand how this patient is cognitively functioning in order to make sure that whatever plan we come out with is actually gonna be followed, right? If they are having memory issues, well then I really need to make sure I'm creating a list of everything that I'm expecting them to do. I need to make sure I'm contacting the family if they ended up coming on their own to reinforce, right, what we talked about and what is the plan. Um, so understanding their cognitive status is going to change how I take care of them. So I think that's really important to identify. Falls, you know, a quick question of, hey, have you fallen since the last time I seen you? You probably will get a response of, no, I didn't fall, I just tripped. Well, let's still analyze your tripping episode and see what happened, right? Um, a little later in the functional part, we'll talk a little bit more about falls and the different components of a fall. But, you know, a fall is important, right? It really does tell us a little bit more about their function or about their environment. So, you know, what is happening? And a fall can really lead to high mortality and morbidity. So, so it is an important thing to ask. Uh, their mobility disorders, right? You know, when you're walking around in your home, do you walk well? Do you have to hold on to the walls? Are you holding on to the, the furniture? You know, if they're doing those things, they really probably need more support in terms of their function. So just getting a little bit more history about how they're moving around. Weight is also really important. So, you know, that vital sign for me, after I look at their blood pressures and pulse and oxygen, I'm looking at their weight. Have they dropped? Have they gone up? Or have they stayed the same? Um, so if they are dropping, right, I need to get back into, so how are things going at home? When do you have breakfast? What do you have for breakfast? Do you just have two meals? What do those two meals consist of? Um, and really gauge, are they just not getting enough calories in? Is there something else going on? Um, and they talk a little about nutrition a little bit later too, so we'll get into that a little bit more then. And when we talk about incontinence, right, or their bowel and bladder issues, right, if they're having incontinence, um, you know, are they changing appropriately if they're having incontinence and they're sitting all day, how is that affecting their skin? So making sure that we kind of connect how incontinence is being managed at home and how their skin is doing. Um, and tied to that, right, is constipation as well. If you know, they're not moving around as much, they're not hydrating well, uh, they're gonna have more constipation issues. And, and we wanna keep addressing those proactively. Um, impaction is very painful, right? And disimpacting someone's very painful. So, so we don't want to get to that point. We want to address it before. Elder abuse, you know, we are all mandated reporters. So you always have to keep that ear out if something is not sounding right, where the patient is self-neglecting, right? Um, the family wants to be involved. They're not allowing them. They're not taking their medicines. They're not living in healthy conditions. Do we get APS out there? And, and we are mandated to, to report it and let APS decide if it's really self-neglect or not. Um, or, you know, families, you know, spending money or the patient complaining that families are taking money, obviously all that really important. Um, we still as a society you know, don't identify elder abuse very well. Um, so again, it's just something that we really need to kind of keep our, our ear out for and report. APS does have an online method, which is very quick compared to staying on the phone for 20 minutes. Um, so again, just just making sure that we're we're keeping an eye on that. And then polypharmacy and, and hearing impairment. We'll talk about both of those a little bit more in depth. So polypharmacy is, is huge for our older adults. I'm, I'm sure most of your patients are coming in with more than four prescription medications. Um, and just so that we're reminded, more than four is considered polypharmacy. You may hear different numbers here and there, but in the end, um, more than four prescriptions has is shown to increase risk of falls in our older adults. 
five or more prescription medications does increase the risk of adverse drug reactions. Uh, and there are quite a bit of hospitalizations based to drug-related you know, issues, polypharmacy, and is the fifth leading cause of death for hospitalized older adults. Now, how can we combat polypharmacy? So in our clinic, so at uh, the UT Geriatrics Clinic, the clinicians are the only ones who input and take off medications. So our staff does not review medications with a, with a patient. That is done when we're in our visit. And we purposely made this decision as the clinicians because if a wrong medicine is put in, that's pretty detrimental to an older adult. Um, so we really are focusing on, we are the only ones who put the medicines in. We are the only ones who change the dosing. We are the only ones who change the frequency. Uh, our staff have great protocols where they can assist with refills and all those things. If it's in the system, they are able to do it, but they are not adding or, or taking out medicines. Whenever we're looking at any new issues, right, we're always weighing the risk versus benefit. We have an amazing Beers criteria that can help guide you. Um, the reality, though, is pretty much every medicine is on Beers criteria because in some way or form, it can be a risk to an older adult. So we're really just having to analyze the risk versus benefits. We really, really try to focus on non-pharmacological uh, treatments. So I'm always really excited when I hear presentations and they're talking about the conservative treatments or the conservative options. We really try to push that as well for our patients. And a lot of our patients don't want to be on more medicine. So, so educating ourselves on other non-pharmacological treatments I learn from my patients who say, oh, I tried this supplement and, and it helped me for this, right? I may look into it a little bit more, but again, having a little bit more in our back pocket for non-pharmacological treatments for patients um, if possible. Always looking, so another component to reviewing the medications, it gives me an opportunity to really stop unnecessary medications, really asking, you know, are you still using this? Is there still a need? Can I take it off, right, so that we, we minimize your medication list? Um, we're always looking at decreasing or tapering um, medicines, if possible, and monitoring adverse effects and avoiding the prescribing cascade. So I usually really like to talk to um, the residents and students every time our patients have a new issue. All right, are we just sure that this is not a side effect from something else, right? We don't want to keep, you know, we have a medicine, it's causing a side effect, so we're going to add another medicine, and we're just going to keep adding medicines till hopefully the patient feels okay, but maybe we could have eliminated that first one, and it would have minimized two or three extra medicines. So really always asking, are my medicines helping me or hurting me or the patient, and, you know, is this appropriate for them? So nutrition is one, and and um, the next component is going to talk about functional status, but in the end, um, we're going to introduce it a little bit here because every geriatric symptom, syndrome is not just the medical component, right? It's the functional component. It's the cognitive component. Like everything is just tied in together. So, so here we're going to talk a little bit about um, poor nutritional status triggers and how is all of the different components kind of tied together. And so, you know, the first right trigger really can be where we're noticing weight loss, a low BMI, right? And that will be the trigger to kind of start asking the questions. You know, how are you doing? Are you hungry? You know, are you eating well? Um, and just gauge whether the patient really can express what is happening and why there may be a weight loss issue. If they cannot, right, so so we take care of a lot of patients who cannot give me that history. Well, then I'm kind of starting from the top down, right? You know, let's start with your mouth. You know, let me look in the mouth. Are there any issues? Let me push. Is the jaw causing any pain? You know, is there anything that, that's stemming from the mouth? If not, how's the swallowing? Are they coughing when they drink fluids or um, eat? Uh, if not, what about maybe reflux, right? 
Um, do we notice that there's pain after they eat? Um, are they seeming to complain after they eat? Are they grimacing? Um, what about gas, right? Do they get real gassy? And so then they don't want to eat. Um, maybe there's constipation, right? If they're so backed up and, and they don't want to eat, maybe that's an issue. Uh, quite a few times, actually a couple of times now, I've had patients with dementia that really can't give me a history. And we're actually checking, um, um, we're doing a right upper quadrant ultrasound because I've had a couple with gallstones or cholelithiasis. Once we saw that issue, they eat very well again, right? But they couldn't tell us that every time they ate, they were getting pain. And so they just weren't eating. So, you know, again, really just have to kind of start from the top down um, for our patients that, that can't express it to us. But now beyond the physical component, right? Looking at um, how their um, functional impairment might be causing an issue, right? Maybe it's just their, their memory, right? They're, they're, nothing's triggering them to eat meals. I had a very lovely couple who would say, oh yeah, we're eating well. And so when I really said, okay, tell me what you eat. What do you eat for breakfast? And they kind of then started to realize, you know, we don't really cook. Like we eat crackers with some cheese and, and that's about it. So, so, you know, they just don't have those triggers to really follow good meal plans, but, but we have to analyze it for them. Um, again, maybe they're dependent uh, on more things where, you know, they, they can't get up and cook. Um, maybe they are depressed. Um, you know, they just don't have the desire to eat um, or there's a lot of social isolation. And then if they are functioning really well, but maybe they just can't drive, right? If they don't have, if they're not driving, they don't have transportation, maybe they're not getting the food that they need. Um, or getting into a car and walking H-E-B is just too much. They get too tired, right? So, so they just don't do it. So again, right, looking at a whole picture for one issue is really crucial. So now again, we'll get into functional assessment. So like we mentioned, function is really the key to, to taking care of the older adults. Um, so functional decline, why do we focus on function? And that's because it is the best predictor of institutionalization. Um, people can report how their function is doing and it is actually an accurate predictor of their health risk and cost. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And at least about 23% of older adults report some functional limitation in either IDLs, but obviously as they age, that's definitely much higher. So this is our, our typical functional status, right? What we'll be talking about when we talk about functional status. And we have the ADLs, which are the activities of daily living. And then we have the IADLs, which are the instrumental activities of daily living. And we, we look at these two as the functional status needed to really stay at home by someone, you know, by yourself and versus the others that I can get some help for and, and I can still function well. Um, so activities of daily living, a person really needs, if they are gonna stay home by themselves, they really need to be able to at least transfer to toilet, right? Continence would be great so that they're not soiling and then, you know, having issues with that. But, you know, again, transfer to toilet to make sure they stay clean. Because again, we worry about their skin and that those issues and being able to feed themselves, bathing and dressing. I mean, again, they could probably get a little bit of support with that and still be fine at home. Um, but the activities of daily living really are the core functional to be able to be by yourself for periods, for long periods of time. And then again, the instrumental activities of daily living, if they hired someone to travel and shop for them, you know, again, not a, not not going to really be a big factor in terms of them functioning at home. Um, somebody to prepare meals or do the housework. Somebody can even do their medicines, right? If a child comes or a sibling comes and does their medicine for a week at a time, right? Still, still pretty reasonable um, that they're functioning at home by themselves, but they're just getting a little bit of that support. And then managing money can still be done on the outside. And so this slide again, kind of reinforces how everything is tied together, right? 
So our activities, our function in terms of our activities of daily living and our instrumental activities of daily living, they are all tied to the different functional assessments or the different components of the geriatrics assessment. They're tied to environment. They are tied to psychosocial. They are tied to the physical and the cognitive. So, you know, um, again, in terms of cognitive, if someone does have dementia, well, how is that, uh, you know, interfering with their ability to even identify that they need help with meal preparation or to identify that they need help with shopping um, or for them to identify that they do have issues with toileting and, and transferring. Um, in terms of environment, right? If somebody is not functional, but they are in their home by themselves with no neighbors that will help, family is far away, in a neighborhood that maybe is not very um, convenient or open for them, how do we how do we again assess that this is going to be a reasonable plan for this person and especially long term, right? Um, psychosocial. How is depression or anxiety or other psychological or psychiatric issues, right? How are those affecting this person's ability to function on their own? Um, caregivers as well. God bless caregivers. Um, I tell all our students and trainees that when a caregiver is asking for help, chances are they probably needed help for more than a couple of years. And they're they're just finally at this this place where they, they're gonna ask. Um, so caregivers, you know, suffer through a lot. And but how is it affecting them and their and their function? And then the, the true physical, right? How is pain and gait and their medical conditions really affecting their function? So when we talk about again, why is function um, important and a predictor of, of other things? So a functional person at age 70 who's completely independent has a pretty good life expect expectancy. And it, they also don't require a lot of cost in care. You add one ADL deficit, right? So this is one deficit where, oh, they need a little bit of help with money. They may need help with shopping. They may need help with meals. And with one ADL deficit, you pretty much doubled, you know, their cost in care while coming down a little bit in their life expectancy. Now you add an ADL deficit, right? They can't toilet, they can't transfer, um, bathe or dress. Now their cost has almost tripled um, per year, right? This is annual. And their life expectancy has come down a little bit. So we know the more functional dependence they have, the more complicated their care, the more costly the care. So again, how do we work together as a team to, to take care of these patients? So here, uh, again, in terms of function and in terms of every geriatric syndrome is a comprehensive issue. Um, so if I do have a patient who has a fall, while I'm asking their story, I'm gauging, is vision the issue? They tripped over you know, the step because they couldn't decipher that you know, there was this kind of uh, change in depth, right? How do we help them with that? Um, in their sensory, you know, do they have neuropathy? Is the neuropathy the issue that they really couldn't sense the change in, in the flooring? Um, vestibular, right? Were you dizzy? Were you lightheaded? I'm checking their orthostatics, right? Is there any anything that's telling me that every time they're standing, they're, they're actually having some other issues that we need to address? Um, musculoskeletal, right? Is it a true strengthening issue? If we get some physical therapy, will that help them be able to function a little bit better? And then central processes, right? Whether, whether you know, they are having an advanced cognitive decline and they really aren't going to gauge, right? They, they can't decipher what, what is a risk and what is not a risk. Um, a lot of my patients walk in without walkers, even though they really need it, but refuse it. You know, unfortunately, at that, some point, I can't force them to do that. So, and so this is another um, predictor. So, of function, how function or speed can predict survival. Uh, so, this is where on this y axis we have median survival. We have, or on the uh, yeah, 
Oh, I guess they have a double what, but anyway. And then an age um, here on the bottom axis, while well, they have gate speed um, overlapped. And you'll see a young person at age 65 with a very normal gate speed will actually gain about 30 years, 30 plus years of survival. This very, very functional person, even at age 95, um, still has an expected survival of about eight years. Years here. If you look at the same 65 year old, if they were really uh, not functional, really disabled, disability, uh, uh, disabled um, here, then you would look at probably about eight years after age 65, while a 95 year old with a lot of debility, you know, we're looking at two to three years. So again, really looking at their function can help you predict how long does this person um, gonna survive and, and what should be our goals when we're talking to them. A quick, which um, we'll talk a little bit more here, but it is part of that rapid screen. So a quick test, right, to, to check on someone's function um, and speed really is the get up and go test. So it's it's your ability um, to monitor um, this, this process where they would stand up from a standard armchair. They are not supposed to push on it, right? In, in theory, if they're doing it well, they do not need help to stand up, they are gonna stand up on their own. They are gonna walk 10 feet, turn and walk back to the chair and sit down. They definitely can use their footwear and they definitely can use their walking aid. We do not want a fall during the test, um, but we are not supposed to give any physical assistance. So obviously they cannot complete it. You you just you know eliminate the test, but these results are strongly associated with functional independence in ADLs. So typically less than 10 seconds, you know, this is a person, this is probably one of those, you know, too well to, to be in our clinic kind of person. Um, 10 to 19 seconds, all right, you know, there, there's a little bit of a delay, but but not horrible, right? They're they're still doing okay. So typically we would say under 19 seconds is 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 reasonable. Then you're looking at though the little bit slower mobility, right? 10 to 29 seconds, greater than 30 seconds. These are lower mobilities, high fall risks. Um, so overall, right, just gauging. And again, an even quicker test, right? If you've got 15 minutes and you're trying to get through multiple things, even just asking the patient to get up from the chair to sit the exam table, you can gauge how fast and how easily they can do that. And you can already start deciding in your mind, hmm, is this a person that's really having functional issues or is this a pretty healthy person that it, it took no effort whatsoever? So again, when we're talking about function, you know, vision, hearing, all of these things are gonna be um, big factors in how a person can function out in the world. So cataracts, glaucoma, obviously macular degeneration, all of these things can get worse with age. And um, for us as geriatricians, I always think they're very important. I am never shying away from my 80 to 90 year old who needs cataract surgery, because if improving their vision is gonna continue to help them function well, then I think that's important. Um, if they are an older adult who are in the nursing home, they're already you know, wheelchair bound, well, again, I'm looking at their prognosis. I'm looking at how much how how functional they are at this point and deciding whether that's really uh, reasonable or not. And and you can assess just by, you know, asking them, you know, when you watch TV, do you have any issues? When you read the newspaper, you know, are there any concerns and let them lead you to um, concerns that they're having. And then again, hearing. Hearing is probably um Another really important, a lot of our patients will say, well, I don't want to wear the hearing aid. And again, I don't force it unless I start seeing some of the ramifications. And impaired hearing can increase depression and social, social withdrawal. You know, if a person goes to a, a dinner, whether it's their family or their friends, but they can't understand what the conversation is about, they're going to prefer not to go, right? So the next time they're asked, they're going to say, no, I'll just stay home. 
And that's when we start seeing where the decline will definitely start happening. So that's when I start pushing for the hearing aids, um, if it's really starting to impact their um, social life and their quality of life. Most importantly, anytime someone tells me, I think I'm having hearing issues, we're always checking their ears. Because if we can clean out some wax and get them hearing a little bit better or just you know help them feel a little better because sometimes it's painful, um, you know, that's a win win for everybody, right? And and it avoided hearing aids, which are obviously very expensive um, and not covered by most insurances. So really just making sure that we're taking a look in their ears and, and helping them with that. All right, psychological um, assessment. Again, um, talking about dementia and depression. So why do we screen? Well, a lot of people with dementia do not complain of memory loss, right? So if you start sensing something is wrong, this is where I start, you know, asking permission, right? Because you always have to ask permission. Is it okay with you if I share our visit with, you know, one of your kids or whoever you decide, right? They can tell me who they're okay with me calling. And then I call and I share. I would probably say out of 10 times, nine out of the 10, there were concerns from the family's perspective. They just, mom and dad didn't let them come to the visit. You know, they don't know how to approach it. Um, and only once was somebody said, no, I really don't think there's an issue. So, but in the end, we do our due diligence to make sure that, that we're addressing this issue. Um, cognitively impaired older persons are at increased risk for accidents, delirium, medication, um, non-adherence, and, and disability. So, you know, just because there is some cognitive impairment obviously doesn't mean they can't be by themselves or they can't uh, live alone. It just means they need a little bit more monitoring, right? If their kids haven't heard from them in two days, their kids need to check in. They may have a UTI, they may have a pneumonia, and they can't tell us what's happening. And so that's where it's just understanding that there is a little bit of an issue. Family needs to be a little bit more involved so that we can make sure that we prevent any major issues. Cognitive decline doubles every five years after age 65. Um, this statistic says nearly 50% of those age 90 plus will have some cognitive decline. Um, the one I typically um, quote is 80% of our patients over age 80 will have some memory loss. And, you know, dementia is a, is a hard word for patients and families, right? So so we want to be clear that if we are making that diagnosis, we, we are truly making the diagnosis based on not only the memory test, which we'll, I'll show you in a bit, but it's a, a poor score on the memory test in addition to decline in functional status. So when their memory or their cognition is affecting their ability to do things independently, now we are having issues with, with dementia. So we just wanna make sure that we understand it's not the test by itself, it is in addition to decline in functional status with the memory loss. And obviously, if the families are noting, that's obviously a big red flag. Um, if you need true testing, the neuropsychological testing, which is the two to four hour testing by neuropsychologist, um, can help you with that as well. A really brief, and so the rapid screen, um, when we talk about that, we'll show this test Right, this test can really be under a minute or two. Um, the mini cog, you give them three items, you ask them to draw you a clock, and then they repeat the three items. If they are unable to give you more than two of the items, or if their clock is abnormal, you know that there are some cognitive issues. If they can recall, you know, the two items and a normal clock, well, they're doing okay. So maybe we just need a little bit further testing to gauge where they're at. At UT, um, I trained and, and we continue to use the slums pretty pretty consistently. Um, what we like about it is it's very easy to give, right? You basically read the question and you can give the test. They do have an English and Spanish, um, but just so that people are aware, right? It's, it's not technically the standard test. Um, MOCA is actually used in our Biggs Institute, uh, a little more advanced, there is actually a four page instructions and I have to literally read the instructions as I'm giving the test each time because it's just something that you you can't memorize. Um, and this one actually comes in many languages. I think it was like 20 language, 
it comes in. Um, so definitely a little bit more in-depth test, um, takes a little bit more time to give. As we've been working with the bigs, um, they we're doing a lot of research associated um, trials over there. So we are even looking at just using the MMSE again, because a lot of the research trials go based on MMSE scores. So that's something that we're actually looking at possibly changing um, in our clinic and at the bigs. Again, so assessing so psychosocial or psychological status, um, major depression, typically pretty low, but subclinical depression, pretty common. So asking a general question, do you often feel sad or depressed? We can talk a little bit, this generation often does not admit to depression, right? So that's, that's the first issue. And a lot of them may not even understand what depression is. Um, so, so if they don't kind of give you that sense of, yeah, I'm not sad or not depressed, but you're still noting, you know, they're not going out the way they used to. They're not, you know, doing their hobbies. They're not being engaged. They're losing weight. They're sleeping all the time. Then I think it's very reasonable to give the geriatric depression scale, um, which I'll show you next. Also watching for any bereavement, right? There's lots of loss in this age group as well. They're losing, you know, loved ones and family members and friends. So, so obviously that's a, a big issue. So in terms of the geriatric depression scale, uh, yes or no questions. Some of the questions I think are a little bit hard, you know, to ask a person, but, you know, do you feel pretty worthless the way you are now? I always kind of you know, warn them when I'm going to give that, that question, but in the end, what it's looking at, so it's not just a, are you depressed? It's, have you dropped many of your activities and interests? Or do you often get bored? Uh, let's see. Do you stay, do you prefer to stay at home rather than going out and doing new things? And of course, obviously, obviously with a little caveat, right? If this person was a homebody and they always prefer to stay home, okay, fine. But, you know, again, this is really looking at how has their social interaction changed? You know, if they were a very outgoing person and now they're not, depression may be a component that they're just not recognizing. So now we'll talk a little bit about social assessment and environmental assessment. So really just looking at the, the whole picture about their needs in terms of safety and um, resources. In terms of social history, so my first new patient visits always includes a talking about, you know, how much education did they have? What were their previous um, um, jobs? What are their hobbies? How do they keep themselves busy? Then looking at their quality of their relationships, right? How many children have you had? Who lives here in town? Who is your support? Um, you know, health of a partner, right? If they mention that, you know, their husband or their wife is really sick. Well, then again, who is here to support y'all as a caregiver, that caregiver role, you know, how are you functioning? How are you doing? Um, I will ask them typically what a typical day is. So I can get a sense of, do they get up and then just sit and watch TV all day? Or are they a busy, active person? So really understanding what a, a typical day looks like for them. And then, you know, how are they getting around? Um, the best thing about geriatrics so and why I love geriatrics is really learning their life experiences. So really learning about some of these really unique things that, that patients have done um, or just, you know, again, amazing stories um, from their end and really just learning from them. So I, I love learning significant life experiences. And then obviously advanced directives as well. We talk a little bit about caregivers. Um, you know, this is a little bit more intense um, interview for caregivers. I'll be honest, if you have a patient there with a caregiver, you literally just have to ask, and how are you doing? That simple question will give you a sense of this caregiver is overwhelmed or they're doing well, right? They're going to either say, oh, I'm okay, you know, thanks for asking, or they're going to give you the sigh and, you know, they don't even know where to start, right? So literally, you know, caregivers are our second patients. Let's just make sure we're asking them how they're doing. And, and that really will open up for future issues um, if they're having any. In terms of home safety, so an occupational therapist, so you can order home health 
occupational therapy if you have concerns and they can go out to the home and really assess the safety um, of the home. Our home visits, and this is why I really love our home visits, but uh, our home visits, you know, that we get to do this as well, right? I get to look for the rugs, if you can see in that top picture, right? Do they have rugs that are not, you know, taped down or stapled down or nailed down? Um, looking in the refrigerator, you know, do they have a lot of old food? Um, looking at their bathroom, do they have great, you know, grab bars so that they can use it? Another great thing in terms of um, the clinicians doing the home visit is looking at their medicines. Uh, you know, I can't name how many times I asked them to pull out, you know, their pill box and their pill box one day has three, one day has two, one day has one, right? And yep, they they say that that's the pill box that's ready for the week and it, it's not matching whatsoever. So, so really being able to get a sense of how things are going in the home. Um, but again, if you're not able to do that, you, we have occupational therapy and home health that can do that component. Um, if you are fortunate enough to be able to do it yourself, it's great um, experience um, for you and, and the families. All right, so rapid screening. Again, I completely understand when we are limited on time, right? How are we gonna address all these different components um, for a patient? And so if, if if you only remember a few things from today, um, keeping in mind the four M's. There's actually another one called the five M's, and so I'll add that at the end of it, but um, four M's. What matters most to the person? Medication, mentation, mobility, okay? Money is the fifth M. And again, we'll talk about that at the end, but so, if I have a short visit that, that, you know, I'm pressed on time, again, I do review all the medications myself. So going through the medications and just making sure I'm not seeing anything that's, that's you know, really needs to be addressed, uh, making sure in terms of memory and, and cognition, right, that this is the person that I, I'm giving the plan to, I shouldn't be contacting someone else. In terms of mobility, just asking them to get up from the chair to sit in the exam table, that can take us, you know, 30 seconds to, to see what is this person's mobility. And if you just tackle one medical concern from them, you can ask them, what would matter most to you? What, what is, what could I change today for you that could bring you more happiness or better quality of life and and see what they say right i get answers probably one of the most common is incontinence issues right hey doc i really haven't even left the home because i'm worried about incontinence and you know if if i could get that better i could probably go to the activities at the assisted living um so you know just really raising that question what's most important to you if i could address or improve something for you that could bring you more happiness or a better quality of life, what would that be? And again, tackling that one thing with time, right? Again, depending on what the issue is, but um, really being able to change something for an older adult that controlling their diabetes and high blood pressure and all those things, even though that's great, it really doesn't affect their whole function and quality of life the way one of these things may. And then if the fifth one we want to talk about is money, obviously money is so important in this age group. Um, I can diagnose a new AFib and I have to think about, can they afford the $100 copay to Eloquist, right? What is that medicine going to do in terms of the, the rest of their financial situation? Um, or the family that comes in and says, oh, okay, we're getting ready because we want the insurance to pay for memory care. And I'm the one who have to tell them, Insurance doesn't pay for memory care, right? So if you don't have six thousand dollars extra a month, you we got to figure out something else. Um, so so money is huge. Um, you know, as a society, we really don't take care of our older adults well in terms of finances. So so money is a huge component um, to considering your older adult patients. Again, just some quick questions. So right for dementia, do you feel like you have problem with your memory? Uh, delirium may be, again, for, for their caregiver, because most of the time they're not aware of the sudden changes. But falls, have you had any falls recently? 
incontinence, are you able to make it to the bathroom without any accidents? Uh, depression, are you depressed? Uh, malnutrition, again, how's your appetite? How do you get your meals every day? Uh, for functional status, you know, this could be a questionnaire just because of your health or physical problem. Do you need any help to shop or do housework or walk across the room, take a bath or shower or manage the finances? In terms of mobility, the time to up and go test, right, is a, is a pretty quick rapid screen. In terms of nutrition, have you lost more than 10 pounds over the past six months without trying? Or again, just looking at their weight from the last time they came to the, to the time now. Did they lose weight? Um, asking them if they're unable to read their newspaper headlines. Asking for any hearing loss. The cognitive function would be the mini cog, which was at three questions and then draw me a clock. And then depression, do you feel sad or depressed? So in summary, um, I hope we talked a little bit about why function is so important um, for a geriatric or an older adult patient. The different components of a comprehensive assessment, including the physical, cognitive, psychological, and social aspects, and recognizing that when we kind of when we do a whole assessment, um, a, it, it does promote wellness and independence and function, and hopefully giving you a few rapid screens um, for y'all to do during your visits. All right, those are my references. Any questions? I have a question. Okay. So in our in our clinic, what would be your suggestion for us to tackle this like step by step? Because I as I understand, we cannot do it all in one visit. So what would be like the key points like I should focus on when I first see an elderly patient? Yeah. And and I'll be honest, right? So when I was in residency at that point, I could see my patients at least monthly. I don't know if y'all's panel sizes have changed or not, but um, I could probably see them monthly. Now I can only see them maybe every three to six months, right? So so my visits, you know, being 30 minutes are a little bit more helpful than than the 15. But it really comes back down to this, what matters most to them. Um, so, so, you know, again, you have one question to ask, you've reviewed their medicines, you know, you're kind of assessing function and how functional they are, <clears throat> what matters most to them and, and let them guide you. Right. So, so that's where you take this, this different shift of, I really got to control the diabetes and high blood pressure. Cause that's going to be best for them coming back to what is important to you. And, you know, a lot of patients will come to us and say, you know, I told my doctor about the incontinence and they said, I'm old and I just have to live with it. We send, you know, we did our conservative management. Are you decreasing your caffeine? Are you decreasing your salt intake? You know, how, how do we conserve it this way? If that doesn't work, let's try the new meds. We have some great meds now that don't cause a lot of cognitive issues like oxybutynin. So, you know, can we try that? And if not, we have urogynecologists. I mean, UT, we have specialists that can do pessaries, um, you know, they can do surgeries, they have stimulators. So there's so much now. Um, so if this one issue is important to this person, even though you may feel like you didn't address, you know, all the other components that are important to us, you actually made a big difference in this person's life. And I think that's probably the goal. But thank you. Good question. Yeah, question about money. You mentioned uh, sometimes the medications give them a challenge, but I sometimes worry about um, as people decline, getting they get cheated out of their money. Do you uh, have any tips for are dealing with that? Yeah. Um, well, are they cheated out of their money by pharmas or by the pharmacies or by family? <laughs> so I think it's kind well, of well. Some of it could be family. Sometimes it's. Um, neighbors you know it's uh, yeah. sometimes it's people trying to you know people that sell them stuff yeah. uh people that call them and try to give them to give money to bogus uh charities all, all, there's a whole yeah. gamut of things so a family so in i mean i know i'm sure y'all noticed too right probably in the last two to three years spam calls robo calls have just blown up our phones um i had a family that actually found you you pay for the service but it, it wasn't very expensive and, and they're actually starting to pay for services to minimize the robocalls because they are giving their money away, right? I mean, they, they are 
donating to bogus issues and losing their money. Um, the only way families are finding out if families are involved. So if a, if a person's not involved, I mean, so, I mean, that's a good one. I, I don't typically ask, are you donating money to, you know, to the phone people <laughs> or whoever's calling you? Um, but it is a good question to ask. You know, we, we I'm not doing that regularly. Um, so that's an interesting tip. Do you have the name of that service or could you get it for um, us at some point? Let me let me see if I can find it. Yeah. Um, yeah I think I that'd be interesting. I'd like to know that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but I, but those are the kinds of things that, you yeah. know, again, we learn from our other families, too. Right. So when somebody does say, hey, this was happening. Oh, well, what did you do about it? Right. And mm -hmm. see where the families because the families will research it and start start finding mm -hmm. a way to solve the problem. Um, and then, you know, it's really hard. I got, I got a, an APS called me for another family. And I think the bank actually called APS because a son came to help his mom who has dementia, sold a house. And then I think he somehow transferred a large sum of money to himself, which he had told mom, I came, you know, to come take care of you. I didn't work for five months. Right. I, I need some money to to help me well, for the five months that I was here, but nobody really knew how much. So the bank, I think, called APS because the son's upset at the mom, the family saying we didn't do it. I said, well, I didn't do it. You know, APS called me. Um, and and so I think the bank. So I think there are little um, safeguards in places, but definitely not enough. I mean, I don't think we, we don't ask these questions enough um, for our patients. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for an excellent grand rounds, and uh, we miss you here. And thanks for coming home for an hour to help us out. Oh, such a pleasure. Thank you all for having me. Have a good one.